Welcome to Obsidian Dome, uh, one of the really cool volcanoes on the eastern part of, on the east side of the Sierras here in Central California. Uh, looking up towards the summit of this steep-sided um, volcanic material here. We'll get to the name here in a second because there's a bit of a uh, little technical misnomer, I suppose, with the name. But let's start with the a regional context here about Obsidian Dome, because Obsidian Dome is an interesting volcano in its own right, um, but it's actually part of a series of volcanoes, a whole chain of volcanoes that more or less start near Mammoth Mountain in uh, on the east side of the Sierras and extend northward uh, to Mono Lake. This is called the Mono Inyo Craters chain of volcanoes. And these Create these volcanoes are all fairly young. They've all erupted within the last few thousand years. They form a chain of volcanoes that more or less trends north-south, again from the Mammoth area and the Long Valley Caldera, which is shown here with this outline. Um, and then you can see the location of all the volcanoes here. Let me get the right little zoom here of the chain. We're right now at Obsidian Dome, which is right here, part of the Inyo chain. And then north of the highway, the name changes to the, the Mono chain. But it's all part of the same system. And all these volcanoes are um, here because of the basin and range extension. We've got the Sierras to the west a big normal fault that bounds the east side of the Sierras and marks the edge of the Basin and Range province. And so from here eastward, uh, there's a tremendous amount of crustal extension east-west. Because we're thinning the crust with that extension, that allows magma to generate uh, with the depressurization of the lithosphere, and that allows magmas to rise and form these volcanoes. Most of these volcanoes, if we come down here to the, and this is from the USGS, I'll add the the uh, source here, but you can see the, the the symbol for steam blasts, explosive eruptions, and lava flows. And for the most part, uh, these explosive eruptions are rhyolitic in composition, and these ones are basaltic. Most of the volcanoes in the chain, if you look at the symbols over here, a little bit light to read those, but they're mostly uh, in the felsic category. So they're mostly erupting rhyolitic magmas, and that's because they're originally basaltic magmas at depth, but as they uh, move up into and underplate the uh, granitic rocks of the that, uh, that are in this from the Sierras, um, that magmatic and mafic magma, uh, excuse me, that mafic magma, the silica low or silica poor magma, um, becomes enriched in silica as it starts to partially melt some of the granite, and that becomes a felsic magma, a silica rich magma. So the point is that these magmas that ultimately make it their way to the surface here, uh, trap a lot of gases, they become sticky and pasty, and they become much more explosive than basaltic magma. So a little regional context there for these volcanoes. Um, we're gonna head up, there's a little uh, old road here that provides access. Uh, it's usually pretty tricky to get out onto obsidian flows. This particular um, flow and this volcano here, uh, erupted in the year 1350 and it started like a lot of the Mono Inyo volcano started with an explosive phase of initially blasting out pumice and some ash and then once that gas rich portion of the magma chamber was released then it started oozing out this sticky pasty lava. Um, so it's hard to tell from here but Obsidian Dome is actually um, not accurately named, in, at least in, in terms of geologic names that we apply to these volcanic structures. Uh, a lava dome will come out of a central vent and that lava will pile up around the vent but really won't flow very far. If you look at a satellite view or Google Earth view of Obsidian Dome, it's actually elongated. It's actually what's called a coulee, a lava coulee. It's kind of a hybrid between a, a actual lava flow and a lava dome. Um, so the lava here has oozed up out of the vent, but it's actually moved downhill a little bit and it's formed a more elongated um, elongated structure that we might see otherwise. So remember that the way these rocks form is with um, this sticky pasty lava oozing up out of the ground, welling up. And because there's so much silica, there's so much um, atoms of silica in the 
lava that the atoms can't move through the material very easily and so with that with the the sluggish movement they have through the lava they tend to cool and crystallize before they can bond with other elements and that's why you end up with volcanic glass so if we look at this thing and we've seen this before in some of my other videos there's this um, close relationship between uh, pumice and obsidian you can see that in here you can see this black obsidian here and then if i just move the camera up a little bit you'll see this gray layer that has a lot of holes in it a lot of vesicles so you've got the obsidian and the pumice sort of intertwined the more frothy gas rich section of the lava and the more uh, gas poor regions as well uh, a couple other cool things we see in some of these blocks here uh, this one shows some nice what we call bread crust structures you can see these fractures these cracks in it that form when it cools so quickly it's still a little bit molten on the interior but the lava is cooled completely on the outside and so as that lava tries to move through it actually breaks it a little bit and you get this this little fractured surface here called bread crust texture similar to bread rising when you when you bake it um, so we'll walk up the trail here a little bit further, see what we can see from uh, this little bit of a roadway here. So we don't have to scramble up this thing. Um, you might notice if you're a big obsidian fan, and I know some of you out there are, that this obsidian, while seemingly attractive to most folks, is not ideal for flint napping. And that's because it contains within it, you might see these little white specks in here, it contains little portions of it that have crystallized. There are some tiny crystals that have formed in here. Um, presumably when this erupted, a little bit of crystallization had taken place in the lava. And the problem with people who are interested in uh, flint napping is these little crystal irregularities or impurities um, a, they inhibit the rock from breaking and pressure flaking the way that they might want it to and so for flint nappers this is what I've heard anyway I'm no expert this is a little bit different difficult material to work with than a much more pure obsidian that lacks some of the little um, tiny crystals in here so interesting to note that you can see some of the banding in here um, that's always the thing I find the most uh, attractive I suppose about obsidian is some of the the flow banding remember this is coming out of the earth like a big uh, thick tube of toothpaste just oozing out of the ground and so it's rolling over on itself it's folding it's deforming um, and so you sometimes get these really interesting flow bands in it which I think we can see up here a little bit Looks like in places there's an exterior where we see the the bread crust texture that's a little bit more pink uh, and possibly compositionally more of a true rhyolite or maybe it's just a, a cooled um, exterior. So up here we get a little bit better exposure of the obsidian and the really nice flow banding in here. It's shining in the sunlight there and looking upwards. So, so I think because of these little impurities, again, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip a bit. Um, my guess is that this, this material is not collected and sought after as much as other localities might be. Um, it just isn't ideal material for flint napping so we'll go up a little bit further here look at some of the flow banding this one nicely shows a little zone of the vesicles a more pumice rich layer kind of cutting through right here hopefully you can see that uh, and then kind of end on right here as well this more frothy zone of the magma. Oh, here's a really nice section up here where you can see all. What's nice here is you can see the the holes, the vesicles, gas bubbles, but you can also see these white specks. You can see some of these little crystals that we saw in the obsidian are also present in the more 
uh, gas-rich vesicular layers that we would call pumice. Pretty awesome. Obsidian dome, but actually not a dome, a coulee, but that's okay. Uh, it's pretty close to being a dome. Right by here, just to the north, the next volcano in the chain is Wilson Butte. And Wilson Butte, if you look at that on Google Earth, is a really classic uh, symmetrical textbook example of a lava dome. But obsidian dome, little too elongate, doesn't quite meet the definition. Again, only probably hardcore geologists care about such things. Um, but it is very similar in terms of how it formed a big goopy paste, goopy um, silica rich lava oozing out of the earth, piling up, forming these very steep fronts here along the margin. Uh, just classic and just a fun place to visit. This is right off a few miles off of Highway 395, uh, just north of Mammoth Mountain. So thanks for joining me. Another little um, volcano we've visited here. All the Mono Inyo volcanoes possibly deserve their own videos, but on this trip I only have time to hit a couple of them, so I'm picking and choosing a bit. And this is one I wanted to hit. So thanks for joining me. Be sure to like, share, subscribe. Uh, also be sure if you'd like to, to donate to helping me get out to make more of these geology videos. There's a thanks button at the bottom right of the viewer on YouTube, and there's a PayPal link under um, the video description. So thanks again from Obsidian Dome, part of the Mono Inyo chain of craters and volcanoes here in Central California.